Good morning and congratulations to all of the organizers of this uh, summit on Puerto Rican health. I particularly uh, want to acknowledge Aida. Uh, she's been a wonderful comadre. I am Diana Bonta. I am an adjunct professor of public health at UCLA. I'm also a trustee of the Annie E. Casey Foundation, uh, which I'm very proud that foundation continues to work on community change in all of our locations. I wanna dedicate uh, this session to a past champion and uh, advocate for social justice. Aida mentioned her, Dr. Helen Rodriguez Trias. She served as chief of pediatrics at Lincoln Hospital in the South Bronx in the early 1970s. Those of you who understand history of our Puerto Rican culture know that the young lords occupied uh, Lincoln Hospital in the South Bronx during those early 1970s, and they were looking for social justice and for empowerment of people. Uh, I uh, actually met Helen at, um, at Lincoln Hospital. I was doing my student nurse rotation uh, through Bronx Community College, which uh, placed us in all different hospital locations throughout the city of uh, New York. So I want to turn now to today's session on the health of PR, the impact of systemic racism and inequities. We're going to focus on factors impacting the Puerto Rican population in the United States and Puerto Rico. Our panel members will each spend 15 minutes on their topics. And after all three presenters, we will then have a question and answer period. And we will stop at 11.45 Central Time. I'd ask you as you're listening, please submit your questions on the chat site and indicate if your question is directed to a specific speaker. We'll look them over and we'll try and then uh, parcel them out to the correct um, panel member. Um, so without any further ado, let me introduce our first speaker. Dr. Larisa Aviles Santa is the director of the Division of Clinical and Health Science Research at the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities at NIH, and the former project director of the NIH initiative, the Hispanic Community Health Study, Study of Latinos. This is an amazing study, over 16,000 participants. She might even update that to even being more than that. She also led the first team that worked in the recovery of health and social services in Puerto Rico right after the landfall of Hurricane Maria in uh, 2017. Larissa was born and raised in Rio Piedras, Puerto Rico, and her medical degree is from UPR. She completed her fellowship in endocrinology at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. She is a pleasure to listen to. I am looking forward to her presentation. Uh, she will highlight some aspects of the health profile of Puerto Ricans from the perspective of population health research, filling research gaps and funding opportunities. Dr. Aviles Santo. Thank you so very much. I would like to share my screen. May I able to do that? I think they have the tech people are giving you permission to do that. Yes, and I am doing it right now. Great. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, now I'm going to, okay. Perfect. Thank you. Good morning, buenos dias. I am extremely delighted to be, to be the better of good news. I, my aim is to really share news of hope and inspiration that we can transform our health through the lens and through the path of research. And with that, I'm going to start with a journey. During the first half of the 20th century, the health of Puerto Ricans, at least as published in different medical journals, focused on infectious diseases, on nutritional aspects of health, 
and on mental health. With the advent of the Framingham Heart Study, the focus on chronic diseases and especially on cardiovascular disease took a different lens and a, a different approach. And in fact, after Framingham published its earliest findings, the Puerto Rico Heart Heart Program took place in Puerto Rico uh, from 1965 to 1980. And it was probably the first, if not one of the first studies on Hispanics Latinos that uh, um, revealed the association between diabetes and cardiovascular disease. After the Puerto Rico Heart Heart Program took place, other studies focused on different Hispanic groups and in different regions across the country took place, including the MESA study. In that time also, one study actually took precedent and was an interesting study and many still quote today. And it's the Hispanic Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which it was a special version of the NHANES that we know and that is performed by annually at, in the US. This one-time study performed between 1982 and 1984, especially recruited participants with Hispanic groups and focused on the three main populations at that time, people of Mexican descent, Cuban descent, and Puerto Rican descent. During the examination or as a result of the examination, the analysis revealed certain differences among those three groups, especially about diabetes. Diabetes being highest among Puerto Ricans and Mexicans and much lower among Cubans. Many years later, after the NHANES, the Hispanic HANES, came the Hispanic Community Health Study Study of Latinos, which is still going on. And this study is extremely important, but also unique. It is unique for these reasons. Number one, one of the aims of the study was to really represent the diversity of the Hispanic population now in, in many years later after, after the Hispanic Haines. We wanted to represent the communities where the study is done, although it's not a national study, but we wanted to be representative. But very importantly, the study has continued, it has repeated some uh, assessments, and there is an important question about longevity and mortality that the study will be able to answer sometime soon. Now, in the study, 17% of the participants are uh, of Puerto Rican descent. They, they self-identified as Puerto Rican. I would like to share with you now a few of the many publications that we have uh, released. The first one was on the prevalence of the major cardiovascular risk factors that I'm showing here on, on this uh, box in, in the cohort. And then the sample size at that time, and uh, that baseline was 16,415 participants. So the analysis revealed the following, that 80% of men and 71% of women, this is in the total cohort, had at least one cardiovascular risk factors. Now, a risk factor, I'm sorry. Now, looking at Puerto Ricans as a group, Puerto Ricans had the highest prevalence of three or more of those cardiovascular risk factors. Looking at Puerto Rican men, they had the highest prevalence of three of the five. Puerto Rican women, five of five. In addition to that, we asked participants about their history of coronary disease or stroke. And although this self-reported um, con con self conditions were pretty low across the cohort, the prevalence was much higher among Puerto Ricans. Does this mean that the health of Puerto Ricans was worse and it triggered more cardiovascular disease? It is possible. But it is also possible that because Puerto Ricans reported having health insurance at a much higher rate than other Hispanic groups, it is possible that they were more aware of their conditions. Now, this analysis also reveals some important aspects that I would like to unveil, and is the importance and the opportunity of interventions. 
we have information that we can transform from bad news to good news, from the bad day, a bad day to a good day. And that's how research could be the, the vehicle to do that. In addition to cardiovascular risk factors, we, I want to share an example of another analysis more focused on people with diabetes within the cohort. So in this analysis, we wanted to look at how many of the participants with diabetes um, were reaching the goals of A1C, the, the goal of a good control of A1C, of blood pressure and cholesterol, the ABCs of diabetes. And we looked at, at those across the different Hispanic groups. We also looked at the use of statins to control cholesterol and ACE inhibitors to prevent or delay the onset of uh, renal uh, 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 complications of diabetes. Across the board, uh, 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 to be simple and, and to the point, the, the goals were not necessarily achieved at the best level, um, maybe a little lower than the uh, general population in the US. But the most important thing is that the combination of the three, the ABCs, was attained by 8% of the cohort, including Puerto Ricans, even when Puerto Ricans have reported having insurance or, or a higher rate of insurance than other groups. Here, there's another opportunity for interventions and to understand self-efficacy, education, communication with the healthcare providers, communication with the healthcare systems, health systems coordination, healthcare policy, the built environment, food security, community resources, all those aspects that impact health and decision-making and the ability to self, for self-management and attain the, the guidelines of care. About uh, another aspect studied under the Hispanic Community Health Study is pulmonary disease. And I would like to bring this up because we know that asthma is a common condition among Puerto Ricans. In the cohort, self-reported asthma was much, much, much higher among Puerto Ricans than other groups. But also when the assessments, the tests for asthma were done in the study, that was also confirmed. This is not only confirming that asthma is common or more common among Puerto Ricans. We are talking about adults. We are not talking about children. And this has clinical implications. This has implications of, of what is causing asthma in adults? Are we treating it the best way? What is the response to treatment that we know of? Can we try something new? Can we learn something new about treatment and efficacy of treatment? And can we learn something about how asthma mimics or masks other pulmonary or heart conditions in adults? These are research questions that we could answer with the information and knowing the health of our people. And other studies, and these are not from the Hispanic study, these are other publications show other aspects of health that are important to highlight. And is following guidelines of care. Based on this publication compared, the, the, the authors uh, looked at four practices uh, in diabetes care and compared to the US mainland, Puerto Rico was doing much, much lower in terms of completion of these four items. A similar uh, and related publication about Medicare Advantage showed that in 17 measures that the authors looked at, that looked at diabetes, hypertension, intake of medications, in 17 of those measures, 15 were significantly lower in Puerto Rico. And we are talking about patients who are covered by Medicare Advantage. So what is happening that people who have access to healthcare are not attaining the goals? Again, questions about patient level questions, health system, healthcare system level questions, questions about public policy that impact healthcare. Very briefly, 
we have heard about the longer life expectancy of Hispanics as a group that has been documented by the CDC. In this report from 2015, um, they, the authors took data from 2013. And in fact, as you see on the slide, when we look overall, the mortality of Hispanics is much lower than non-Hispanic whites. But when we break it down by Hispanic group and we compare Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, and Cubans, we see that the mortality of Puerto Ricans is much higher than the other Hispanic groups. And it comes closer to non-Hispanic whites. Uh, similarly, we see that in cancer, we see that in heart disease, and we also see that in diabetes and chronic liver disease. In another analysis, and again, not related to the soul, but very relevant to Puerto Ricans, there is a comparison between Puerto Ricans in the archipelago and Puerto Ricans in mainland. And the mortality, uh, all cause mortality of Puerto Ricans in, in the archipelago is much higher than those in mainland and the same uh, related to diabetes. I want to highlight that although I am share, I have shared with you those findings, there is a path forward. Uh, the NIH has been funding at least two centers, uh, uh, research centers in minority institutions in Puerto Rico, who have been funded for over 35 years. And they have dedicated a lot of resources to basic research and also transitioning to clinical research. This is good news. In addition to all the studies that I mentioned before, two new studies are being performed in Puerto Rico that are going to enlighten us on the epidemiology of cardiovascular risk factors in the population, prospect and PR outlook. Right after the hurricanes, NIH funded grants for immediate collection of data related to the hurricanes and how they impacted the population and or health services. And all of the other uh, examples that I'm showing on this slide have been funded by my institute, NIMHD. Also encouraging, this was published very recently. Puerto Rico was the first to eliminate the transmission of HIV and syphilis from mother to child. And it's documented in this review by Dr. Carmen Sorrilla. And Puerto Rico attained it even before the WHO declared that that had happened in Cuba in 2015. I have two minutes left. Let me move forward. An example in this slide is how the participation of Puerto Ricans in research and the research performed in Puerto Rico and or by Puerto Ricans is also enlightening the field of precision medicine. And particularly the examples that I am presenting here are about the uh, anticoagulants and response to bronchodilators. By looking at differences among populations, we can find pathways, we can discover mechanisms of disease and mechanisms for better treatments. I had the important responsibility of leading the first team in the recovery of health and social services in Puerto Rico in 2017. And I took that back to my work and we published a funding opportunity announcement that is right now, it's active and it's on the long-term effects of disasters on healthcare systems serving populations with health disparities. If you want to know more about this funding opportunity announcement, I'll be glad to answer questions. We have a Goliath at home, diabetes, another funding opportunity announcement that I published. This one is expiring. We are in the process of renewing it, but we want to really tackle this problem about implementing guidelines of healthcare and attaining better health outcomes. And NIMHD, is currently open uh, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, submit and um, created a funding opportunity announcement in collaboration with basically all institutes on understanding and addressing structural racism and discrimination. I would like to end my presentation and I know I'm running, oh, it's four seconds, but I'm running out of time, uh, but I have five thoughts to share with you. And is 
And you do, you do have you do have the more time, okay? I just wanted to let you know that, that, that your panel will be extended to twelve fifteen. So you you should be getting more time. Everybody in the panel, sorry. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this is my last slide. <laughs> so there is no doubt. No hay lugar a dudas que it, we have endured immense adversity, but we do have the power to transform that adversity into great outcomes. And specifically, we're talking about health and through the lens of healthcare research. And inspired by the five points of the star in our flag, I would like to share five thoughts with you. We are a unique Hispanic population. We are unique in culture, in history but we also have some uniqueness about our relationship with the US, about our public policies, about, about, about our healthcare policies, for good or for bad. That whole, that combination makes us unique. And we can use that uniqueness to promote changes and to promote examples and to promote more research that can enlighten the path for others. We have a unique health profile that actually could contribute more to precision medicine. We have phenomenal talent and opportunities to contribute to the field of minority health and health disparities for all the reasons that I have already mentioned. The Lieutenant Governor mentioned resilience and I am glad she did. <laughs> And we have demonstrated that we do have resilience and how we have demonstrated that. And it's not only, like you said, about surviving, it's about being stronger. And th this is something, it's a, a, an area that covers molecular, emotional, physical, spiritual understanding, how we transform ourselves and how we preserve our health or how we are, do not remain healthy. And finally, we can and we are trendsetters in advancing clinical research, patient-oriented research, translational research, implementation science research that transforms knowledge into action. So thank you for your interest and attention. Ha sido un placer, encantada de que me hayan invitado y que tengan un buen día. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. What a what a wonderful presentation. You talked about um, certainly this linked unique population of Latinos, of Puerto Ricans that were talented, that were resilient that we're trendsetters and that uh, we are really at the forefront of this clinical research. I especially appreciate um, Dr. Aviles Santa, how you were able to take very complicated matters because you know these research uh, agendas and the work are very complicated and break it down such that all of us can appreciate the kind of work that's going into this. I'm very proud to have you there at the forefront of this. Thank you. Thank you. I want to now turn uh, to our second presenter. Um, this is uh, a presentation by Ruth Enid Sambrana. She's at the University of Maryland, Distinguished University Professor, Harriet Tubman, Department of Women, Gender and Sexuality S Studies. She's director of the Consortia on Race, Gender, and Ethnicity. She's the author of many books, and I'll uh, name just two of them. One is on equity and inclusion, effective practices, and responsive strategies. This is a guidebook for colleges and university leaders. This is very timely in which uh, universities uh, throughout the country and Puerto Rico are trying to grapple with how to be um, uh, more effective and uh, create strategies that will be such that we have more equity and inclusion. And then another book that she wrote is called The Magic Key, and it's the educational journey of Mexican Americans. And she uh, uses this throughout the age spectrum from kindergarten through 
12th grade, on to college and to beyond. And another book is Toxic Ivory Towers in which she takes on um, academic institutions and the fact that um, so many are not um, supportive of their um, faculty of color and are not advancing their faculty of color at the rates that we should be expecting. Dr. Sembrana was uh, at uh, previously at other educational institutions, including Mount Sinai School of Medicine, the City University of New York Graduate Center. She was a professor as well at UCLA from 1983 to 1991, and she was at George Mason University. She's a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania. She has her master's in social work and her PhD was uh, earned at Boston University. I first met Dr. Sembrana in 1983 at UCLA. I quickly asked her to be on my doctorate committee. I was struggling you know, between family and working and then somehow trying to uh, complete this doctorate. All my coursework was done, but I was just struggling. Along comes Dr. Sambrana. Did she say to me, well, my office hours are such and such? No. She said, Diana, meet me Saturday morning at my house, 8 a.m. I'm going to make you breakfast. We're going to talk as we did about families and shared stories with each other. And then we sat down and did the real work of going over the outline and moving the agenda. So Dr. Sambrana not only feeds the um, body, but she feeds the soul and the mind. And today's presentation, she'll be doing that as well. She'll be talking about health research, equity, and Puerto Ricans. And she wants to answer the question, how are we doing? How are we faring? Dr. Sambrana. Buenos dias. Thank you so much, Dr. Bonta. Um, First, I want to thank Dr. Avila Santa for her wonderful presentation. Um, I unfortunately am not as optimistic as she is, but we will balance each other. So it is my absolute delight and honor to provide an overview of the research enterprise on Puerto Rican health and to offer you key issues that remain unresolved and which haunt the lives of our women families, our men, our children, and our communities. So let me say that I have been studying Puerto Ricans since the late 1970s, from New York to Boston to Philadelphia. And I have mentored many Puerto Rican pioneers because of my age, Diana Bonta, Marilyn Aguirre Molina, and many others who serve in the forefront of both the equity practice and the equity research. They are in this oftentimes alone. And I have also mentored and worked with people at the University of Puerto Rico, trying to get them and support them in an agenda that forces equity. So my remarks today will focus on the research enterprise, which I have been within for about 40 years. My goal from the very beginning was to challenge the stereotypes and the lack of equity and the closed opportunity that was so apparent for not only Puerto Ricans, but for African-Americans and later on at UCLA for Mexican-Americans. So I wanna answer a few questions. What approaches can we use to study uh, health equity? What is the new language or the old language that has become new to, my, to majority culture researchers. What do we know about Puerto Rican health that is new from 40 years ago? Um, and what is the same? What are the major structural barriers to improving our health? How is research conducted? If research is sort of the benchmark for producing knowledge, where does it get translated? And I think Dr. Santa alluded to this and I hope she's right that now we can translate and implement it. And what effective and equitable structural practices and policy changes have we learned from research? So let me talk first about the power of knowledge, of language, I'm sorry, the power of language and the power of knowledge. But knowledge can be twisted 
with the power of language. So there, oh, my wait, I have to share screen. I started talking right away. Um, can everyone see the presentation? Yes. yes. Okay, so yes. it's called Health Research Equity in Puerto Ricans and how are we faring? So language, I'm going to go a little bit. Um, we did the focus into the power of, I couldn't make this much bigger, but let me speak for a minute about this wonderful term called structural racism which finally has become part of the academic vocabulary. Not all, there is plenty of resistance to the use of structural racism in the United States. And there are a lot of scandals going on now, particularly the American Medical Association, who feel that we should not use that word. But structural racism refers to the historical and contemporary policies, practices, and norms that create and maintain white supremacy by segregating racial ethnic communities from access to opportunity and upward mobility. I think some really good examples to translate this, for example, is the attachment of healthcare benefits historically with employment when African-Americans and many Mexican-Americans were really either contract laborers or slaves and were not able to get the type of employment where healthcare benefits was important. And then tying healthcare benefits and employment with social security. So if you don't work, you don't get social security. The other big structural racism policy is tying real estate taxes with educational resources in the community. So we know that housing in low income communities is usually much lower than in upper income communities. So we see that these policies have advantaged one group over another. These definitions are important because they challenge deficit models. They challenge culture as a predictor of adverse outcomes, and they challenge the individual approach. This approach that we could all pick ourselves up by our bootstraps. Well, it's very difficult to do that if policies are really working against you. So social determinants are the social, economic, and environmental conditions in which we are born, grow, live, and work. And they obviously are the outcome of structural racism because those policies and practices influence where we live, how we are, where we are born. Life course seems almost like um, obvious, but many researchers don't understand the impact of life course. If you live under poor conditions, if you do not have access to good food, to recreational spaces, to healthcare, from very young, these things are gonna present barriers throughout your lifetime and are, and are going to impact the outcomes of your life in all many different ways. So as a result of the historic structural racism, we have been denied access to opportunity, which was reflected in the very small number of Puerto Rican professionals in the United States. And we have not been treated equitably. Um, so let me move on. I just wanted to do a, a couple of things. What is different? We have seen a little bit of movement of Puerto Ricans, although there has been a significant diaspora to other places. When we look at the majority, these are the nine states with the majority. Florida has increased substantially in terms of Puerto Ricans. And then we see Illinois is 3.6%. The other thing that has increased significantly is educational attainment, where we have 18% now of US born Puerto Ricans with a college degree, 21% of the island. Immediately, you could see inequity here with US born Puerto Ricans making about 50,000 and island born around 36,000. An important marker of assets and wealth is home ownership. And we see 39%, 36%, and we will see a wealth chart um, in a few minutes. And the other thing is marital status. Puerto Ricans on the island are more likely to be married than Puerto Ricans stateside. 
I think Dr. Avilis already mentioned diabetes is a major uh, condition among Puerto Ricans and that has not changed. That has been the case as has high cholesterol has always been the case. Low birth weight and infant mortality has been highest among Puerto Ricans for the last, as far as I can remember, it has been an issue. Um, the new issue now is obesity. And this is a very worrisome condition, particularly in, in research. And with respect to research, this is going in the wrong direction. But Puerto Ricans have one of the highest obesity rates. They have the most adverse conditions historically. Um, it's 41% for men and 52% for women. On the island, it's about 35% the total population and about 70% are considered overweight as this is a major determinant of the other chronic conditions and adversely affects them. We need to study this in part from a social determinants perspective. So when we look at obesity, what is not mentioned in the obesity research, which I am studying now, are the stresses of being poor, the social determinants of health, the inadequate built environment, which is where we live, the lack of parks, recreational spaces, and most important, where structural racism comes in, a food industry that assures that the food for poor people is fueled by sugar, chemicals, and low caloric nutrients. So obesity has become partly a class issue, as many of these are, because the other things, when we look at research, we're not talking about all Puerto Ricans in many of these situations. We're talking about low-income Puerto Ricans who experience these barriers. And an unregulated food industry in the United States, which we are one of the few industrialized nations that does not regulate our food, so that the food industry profits from poor people's eating habits and habits that destroy their health. So what are the barriers to our moving forward? The wealth gap, the racial wealth gap. So if you look here, which is very interesting, Latinos, and this doesn't even say Puerto Rican, have wealth of about $8,000 in assets, while white people have 111 and African-Americans have seven. When we look at home ownership, which is a big asset, 43% of Latinos have a home compared to 65% and 41% of African American. The other area is, of course, um, work benefits. A lot of people develop their wealth through benefits, which is matching um, savings accounts, et cetera. So we begin to see that wealth matters and wealth is something that does not allow us to move forward. The other thing is representation in the workforce. We are a tiny, tiny portion of percent of students who apply here to medical schools. So for Puerto Ricans is 685, it says 20.8. Now this includes Puerto Rico, the University of Puerto Rico, which is why that number is increased. Um, and this is the number of faculty. So about 3.2% of all faculty, all Hispanic faculty is Latino Hispanic. Um, out of that group, the Puerto Ricans are probably less than 1%. And when we look at research and we look at medical school faculty, very few have the opportunities to do research. And in the universities, which I looked at in my book, Toxic Ivory Towers, yet only 1% of all professors, for example, are Latino women. So we have two major barriers working against us as we look at research and who's gonna do the research and where are the changes gonna come about, particularly in terms of poverty. The third chart I wanna show, which I thought was important, was healthcare access. When we look at federally qualified healthcare centers, again, what we're looking at is that these federally qualified healthcare centers are in our communities and are the primary source of serving 
low-income Latinos. So if we look, this is not by Puerto Rican, but if we look at New York and Illinois, we see that they serve almost 40% of Latino patients in those centers. In New Jersey, it's 47% of the individuals are served who are poor. So if we look here, um, someone mentioned the, and then the uninsured, in spite of the chip and, and the types of, um, of issues of health insurance that has improved, we still have many children who are uninsured. And currently, I think Dr. Giacello mentioned this, about 50% of our children receive Medicaid or CHIP in these centers. So here is a, a community uh, healthcare centers are really important in serving our communities and to increase resources to these centers would be an important equity measure. So let me speak now to how has research been conducted? This is the wrong thing. And how does the research enterprise need to change? The role of research has been to produce knowledge to increase our understanding of the antecedents of health problems and their consequences, and to find solutions to ameliorate the problems that we see in the community. So it's to produce a more comprehensive picture. Research to date has assumed more of an individual approach of blaming the victim, a cultural approach. This new terminology that we talked about turns that around to look at institutional antecedents of health outcomes. Now, who is doing the research? Many of the funding agencies, inclusive of NIH and philanthropic institutions, tend to fund elite and known entities. We have very few um, researchers out there because we have been denied that opportunity. Although we have talked about community engaged research, more often than not, these elite institutions do not actively engage those who know their community. So again, oftentimes the data does not represent the social determinants or the life course impact on many of these individuals. There has been a shift in the 21st century to putting all Latinos together. And SOIL has done a marvelous job in really looking at the different subgroups. But we have to remember that each group has very unique um, issues within their community. And therefore, that's going to influence the outcome. The other big issue in that I think in research is that NIH and others continue to fund large scale intervention studies, which show promise under control conditions. But the actual condition is not diminished, either obesity or diabetes. For example, let me be clear. A walking intervention called Las Mujeres del Barrio is wonderful. Of course, our women love to walk and talk with each other. And a community navigator is there to encourage. But what happens when they leave? Or if they teach them how to cook healthy? What happens when they don't have the money to find those resources? So we cannot continue to engage in interventions that try to change the individual and not the conditions under which they live. So what we have seen over the last 40 years is that the conditions of Puerto Ricans, their health and their living conditions have not changed significantly because we have been conducting research and continuing to reproduce the same research under the same conditions and somehow expect different outcomes. So let me, how am I doing on time? How am I doing on time, Deanna? You're doing well, uh, Ruth. Uh, uh, we got from Maida a, a few more minutes, so continue. Okay. So I think in conclusion, a significant amount of research has been conducted on Puerto Ricans. 
And when I looked at the work on obesity, for example, in the last 20 years and Latinos, it's about a thousand articles. But what has, how has that helped us? What conditions have been changed? How has the built environment changed? So the question is, how do we take the research, what we found and translated and implemented into responsive and equitable policies and programs? Now, although Dr. Santa talked about implementation and translational research, which has finally come into the mind of this country, although we have been asking for that for years. I mean, Dr. Giacello, for example, has done tremendous work in community-based research and nothing happened with those outcomes. So when we look at equity and policies, there are a number of issues that we know need to be out there. One is we need a living wage. Without economics, we can't buy the food, we can't be in the housing, we can't go to the parks in the area. So we need a living wage of $15 with sick and family leave benefits. We need, and these are old. I mean, I know, and probably all my colleagues on this call know, older colleagues, that we have been saying this for years. We need universal childcare, zero to four years of age that really helps those children to get a fair start, to get a fair start. Otherwise, they are not able to compete in the schools. We need equalizing resources for, for K to 12. We are unable to compete in the larger um, arena with upper middle class uh, kids and with the global um, group that is coming in. Um, one idea is that the U.S. Department of Education needs to fund all the schools equally so that kids can have an equal start, a fair start. This is a relatively new idea in the last couple of months. It started with Obama, but free community colleges so that we could provide our students, particularly low-income racial and ethnic students, opportunities to engage in an occupation that would provide them a living wage. We need open access to all public universities with sliding fee tuition. We have a model for that with um, open access, with open admissions, which was a program that was started in the 1970s. I worked at that program in the New York, um, New York uh, University system where every student had an opportunity to go to college with, with a sliding fee tuition, with support services, so that he or she would have that door open to them. And as we just talked about, we talked about increasing comprehensive community, family health centers and co-locating services. Um, so we would have a one-stop shopping so that people could go and I was part of writing the Boricua Community Naval Health Center on 125th Street and 3rd Avenue in New York City, where it was a comprehensive community health center with women's health, with child health, with men's health, and really a one-stop place with health education where people could get their primary, preventive and primary care needs met. We also need childcare subsidies and centers for working families, and we need to provide clearly equity research training programs for Puerto Ricans and other historically underserved groups. That research experience is critical. I have spent a lot of time trying to provide that research experience to many of our undergraduate and graduate students, which would give them a lift to go to graduate school. Now, most research experience at the undergraduate level is a volunteer and we need stipends for that. Again, what we're talking is about programs that work for middle-class kids and we need to have equitable programs that will work for low-income Puerto Rican kids and other racial and ethnic minorities. So my major conclusion is that if health inequity and disparities among Puerto Ricans and other low-income Latinos are a consequence of social and economic determinants and structural racism, then the only solution must address 
the findings and change policies and practices. Until we change, if we, in my view, we should stop doing research until we change policies and practices. Otherwise, we are doing the same research, reproducing the same research, getting the same outcomes and showing surprise. We can no longer do that. We are spending our money on research that could be used to be invested in the community. I think the other thing is that funders need to stop funding pop-up experts. What I'm referring to as pop-up experts, researchers who have no connection to our communities or know or want to know the factors that adversely impact Puerto Rican health yet get funded to do this. And I think we need to insist and I was on a review committee recently, we need to insist that there is a community representative and a researcher from that community. In this case, it was um, in a Mexican, in a, a study of Mexican Americans in the Southwest and the young Mexican American was put as an investigator and I recommended that he be put as a co-principal investigator. He was from that community. And we need to take more bold and, a, and assertive action in trying to get equity, particularly into NIH. We are totally underrepresented in NIH. I think it's still about three or 4%. And we need to get more Puerto Ricans and other Latinos into NIH. Ruth. Um, Ruth. Yes. Um, if, if we could get to the end, and because I want to make sure we have enough time for, um, for Marilyn as well. So, yes. Oh, I forgot about this. So, I mean, social and economic determinants matter. Community voice and leadership matters. Institutional responsibility matters. So we need to be continue to put the focus on the institutions and not the culture and not the individual, and not the community. Americans as voiced by the president of the Rywood Johnson Foundation and other leaders in this country say that Americans don't like equity. They like equality. We cannot have equity. We cannot have equality without equity. So if you look at equity here on the bottom, equity is when we provide the resources needed to individuals and communities to help them to compete equally. So equality is not equity, but to provide equity, we could have an, a chance of equality to compete and to be a healthier Puerto Rican community in the United States and in Puerto Rico. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. I, I know that this is a a crucial topic. I really um, appreciate that you integrated the needs of women and children, and uh, especially as we talk about childcare, because that often gets left to the side. And it's an important part of us making changes for not only Puerto Ricans, but um, for all of our children in uh, the US and Puerto Rico.